Hey, welcome back to another episode of Parker's Pensies. This is a podcast where we explore thoughts and philosophy, theology, nature, and life. I love thinking about cool stuff, so come think with me. Um, today I have a, another special guest on. We're going to be talking about nature and life. Um, a lot of times we talk about philosophy and theology, but I love all this kind of stuff. And so this fits naturally into our in our category of nature and life. I have Greg, Greg Whitstock, the, the pond guy. We're going to be talking about his pond empire, uh, nature, beauty, why he does what he does, and how he got started. Um, before that, if you guys like this show, if you have uh, benefited from the podcast at all, please consider supporting me on Patreon. You can find the link in the description. You can follow us on YouTube, click the notification bell, and you can uh, you can go to Apple Podcasts and leave me a five-star review. I'm out of, I'm out of breath because I ran upstairs to grab coffee. That was a dumb move. But uh, without further ado, let's bring Greg in. Greg, thanks so much for coming to the podcast, man. <laughs> All right, bro. Yeah, nice to meet you. Never seen you before and I uh, love the stash. Dude, I appreciate that. That's huge. So I... I love what you do. Okay. Uh, I found you on YouTube. Um, just super stoked for for everything you do. I wanted to get in and ask you because you're you're an expert in in business and in ponds. You're probably like the one of the foremost pond builders in the world. How would you get started building ponds? I should say your your company's called Aquascape. You're in St. Charles, Illinois. Everyone, go check that out. Check out his YouTube. You can find the link in the description and all that good stuff. But Greg, how'd you get into ponds at all? which you've never visited. We have a Not retail yet. store. We have a giant pond out front, you know, rec pond. Yeah. You know, it's, uh, no, this, I am the pond guy. Yes. That's my YouTube channel. Greg would suck the pond guy. And it's all about showcasing how people live the aquascape lifestyle. Um, boy, uh, I guess when you said that I was an expert in business and ponds, I guess when anybody's been doing something for 30 years, it's mm -hmm. kind of hard not to become an expert in that field. So this is my 30th year in business. I started when I was a, well, I started as a 12-year-old hobbyist when I moved from uh, New Jersey to Wheaton, Illinois, where okay. I grew up. And my mom and dad uh, promised me, because I was not too happy to leave my lakefront home in New Jersey, to the flat, barren cornfields of Wheaton, Illinois. And my mom and dad promised me I could build a pond uh, in my new backyard. And so I loaded up 11 of my favorite pet turtles into the literally the station wagon uh, filled up the bottom drawer from the refrigerator with a little bit of water and had it sloshing around for 16 hours as we drove to our new home. And uh, the second day I was living there, I went in the backyard, started uh, digging a pond, went to the library because this is 1982. This is mm -hmm. the years before the internet and all of the things that you would learn at, you would go to a library and uh, got some books and they were all from uh, Europe or Japan on how to build a koi pond and water garden and i ended up uh it said to build it out of concrete to make it really strong well unfortunately for me in zone five chicago that That's first right. pond leaked turned green and even my prize turtles began migrating away so that oh, was man. the beginning of my odyssey as a 12 year old hobbyist so i kind of made every mistake possible but it was a hobby of mine so every year i got to you know rip it out and rebuild it and after uh seven years of ripping out and rebuilding and MacGyvering up and Jimmy rigging up my own filter systems. Um, it was looking pretty nice and neighbors and friends would come over and they'd sit by it and they thought it was beautiful. And then one day the UPS guy was delivering a package and uh, rang the doorbell and I heard him and I yelled, come around back. And he turned the corner and he goes, this is beautiful. How did you ever buy a house with a spring on it? We thought it was a natural spring and the pond awesome. had been there, which is a good compliment to a pond builder. Yeah. And I said, nah, man, I built it. And he goes, can you build me one? And I thought, well, yes, I could. And so that's how uh, I came up with the idea and the concept, the UPS guy, to start building ponds the next summer. And I remember uh, making phone calls on my lunch break and uh, uh, calling landscapers and asking them how much an 11 by 16 foot pond would cost. And uh, it was a little difficult because it wasn't a normal thing, but anywhere from five to eight thousand dollars was kind of the quotes. And I thought, man, if I build one pond in in May, one pond in June, and one pond in July, I'll make more money building water features for three months than I did, you know, working as a lifeguard. Right. And I ended up uh, in 1991 when I was 21, after my junior year in in college at the Ohio State University, I ended up building. Uh, uh, five water features, $21,000 in sales and $11,000 in net profit because I had no overhead. I just uh, had a 
strong back, a wheelbarrow and a shovel <laughs> and uh, a free trailer that I got from the side of the road and uh, worked out of my parents' garage. So I bought a Nissan hard body pickup truck and went back to college and uh, came back the following season, which was 1992. Uh, I took off the spring and summer because I had sold some water features over the winter that I wanted to come back and do. And I ended up uh, building 12 water features the second season. So five my first, 12 the second. And so um, I had done 17 water features. And then on August 2nd of 1992, before you were born, right, young man? Uh, I, I was 91. So just, Okay, so, <laughs> so you're as old as my business. <laughs> <laughs> um, I ended up uh, getting that, a front page story in the tempo section of the Chicago Tribune. That's a newspaper. People used to read them with yeah. you know, pictures in them and stuff. <laughs> That's right. And uh, they uh, ran a front page story, Jan Golden Pond, young landscape artist, Greg Whitstock, age 22, builds backyard habitats for fish and plants. And... Uh, my business skyrocketed. I mm. ended up, uh, I ended up going on that August 2nd was a Sunday. The following Saturday, I had eight design consultations to visit with people to design water features. And, uh, I'll never forget coming home at the end of the day. It was six, six 30. I'd been on eight consultations for water features and, uh, seeing my mom, my dad, and my sister sitting at the kitchen table, reaching in my back pocket and pulling out $35,000 in deposit checks. That's awesome. That is awesome. I had sold out. Like that was it. I had to go back to college and that was all the jobs I could do. That's when my dad came into the business to help out a little bit. Mm -hmm. And I hired my first time full-time foreman, which is a guy that I went to high school with. And, and the business, uh, the business was officially now uh, from a summertime job to my career. Uh, and at the end of my second season, man, that's fantastic. Did, did you end up finishing school then? <sighs> Unfortunately, yes. <laughs> I uh, I started it, so I was going to finish it. Um, I'm not a firm believer in college education, that's for sure. Uh -huh. uh, it took me six years to graduate uh, with an interpersonal communication degree from The Ohio State University yeah. um, because I was building ponds pretty much six months out of the year and going to school. So, yeah. well, why not? Uh, why not business? I mean, you're you're businessman now. But do you regret that or? Well, I don't regret everything, anything, even going to college, because I love following the Ohio State Buckeyes. Yeah, but, uh, I learned way more from playing football and uh, in high school and being part of a state championship football team, and uh, way more uh, outside of the classroom in college from life skills and being in a fraternity and social chair and rush mm -hmm. chair and hell master and all those things. Any classroom that I ever was in, so. Yeah. Still to this day, I've never taken a business class in my life Nice as a communication major, um, but uh, I learned from the School of Hard Knocks and made a lot of mistakes along the way, but really was spot on with the timing of my business and then my business approach because my main business is not building ponds, although I still get out there and get my hands dirty for fun. Yeah. My, uh, my main business is selling the products that I patented for ponds and um, uh, shipping products all over the world to other contractors and retailers that I can talk to because I am one of them. Yeah. Real quick, Greg, did you, did you go to Wheaton South or, or Wheaton North? I went to Wheaton North when Wheaton North never lost to Wheaton Warrenville South. Okay. Uh, we were the 1986 state champions in 5A football, Dang. Uh, which was my junior year, and we went 13 and one. And then my senior year, when uh, you know I was you know thinking we all thought we were the best, and we uh, we went five and four, and we missed the playoffs and a yeah. double overtime loss. Dang. It taught me a very valuable lesson about culture. Uh, a winning culture is the key to success. And we had the sun, the stars, and the moon line up my junior year and my senior year with arguably an equally talented group of guys. We went five and four because we had a bunch of prima donnas and a bunch <laughs> of people that, uh, you know, weren't about the team. So, yeah, man, we we uh, we liked you guys better. We hated Wheaton South. I went to Glenbard East and Wheaton South okay. would just donkey stomp us as the worst. But we actually lost to, to Wheaton North my senior year in double overtime. Our kicker oh. missed four out of five kicks. And, oh my uh, gosh! Yeah, so what was, did you play? I was middle linebacker. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, it was good times, man. I was I was I was a wrestler that. who played football. I wasn't a football player, but what what was your senior weight class wrestling? I was two fifteen. Wow, you're a big guy. This is really cool. My son, who just graduated high school, we just got off the Appalachian Trail last week. Um, 
he did he was a wrestler he he crazily went out for wrestling as a sophomore in, in high school which i thought dude you're gonna get your butt kicked he ended up <laughs> winning the conference not because he knew any moves jv conference which is a little harder than uh, a little easier than varsity because he had such good conditioning from being a cross-country runner oh and yeah make it into the third period the guy would get exhausted but anyway his very last match his senior year so he wrestled all three years was at glenbard east high school and get <laughs> this dude it was outside. They brought the they brought the mats oh. on because of COVID. They brought the mats onto the field, and it was an outdoor match. That's awesome. I would have loved to do that. High school. I thought this is cool. An outdoor wrestling. It was a beautiful night. It was fun. That's awesome. Well, dude. Uh, so getting back into to the pond stuff, I I had heard uh, from watching some of your stuff that you had patents. Um, how did that come about? How did you start getting patents and making your own products? <sighs> well, that's a big story, but you know. Everything is trial and error a little bit. I mean, I hired a patent attorney in Wheaton and um, applied for a U.S. patent for the filter systems that I had MacGyvered and Jimmy rigged up out of garbage cans and cattle troughs. Yeah. And uh, uh, started, so my, my, my big break came when I got the patent and it wasn't so much about the patent and I'm not a huge firm believer in patents. I'm a big believer in first to market. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we had a paradigm shift where we created a, a simple way of, of, filtering water features that was as was a paradigm shift insofar as everybody was trying to filter dirty water and as a, a builder i was trying to build beautiful water features that happen to have clean water mm -hmm. so uh i made the waterfall unit um i made the filter into a waterfall and where everybody else just had a, a box that sat alongside the pond so you know listen i'm a 24 year old kid i hired a patent attorney in in wheaton and uh it took about a year and a half um that was where my dad came in. Remember I said he came into the business. Mm -hmm. He spent, I was in the field developing and designing the products with a guy that's still with me today, Ed Ballou, who's the pond professor. He's been with me for 28 years now. Wow. And uh, we would take the stuff back to the office and show him what tweaks. And he would work with the rotational molding company that we uh, developed the filters with. And then the patent attorney that, you know, for all of the, you know, 100 page plus document that we ended up having to create for that. And uh, I was I was probably started working on that in 93. In 94, I was granting my patent. And in 95, I started mailing out catalogs to other contractors and shipping our products all over, um, teaching them how to build ponds like I've been doing in the, the Aquascape 20 product, 20 step approach to building water features. Man, that that's awesome. Um, I didn't know Ed was with you that long. Ed, the, the pond professor, for those uh, who are unfamiliar, go check out his channel as well. Yeah. Um, dude's awesome. So. Ed's, Ed's actually a biologist, is that right? Yes, he has a degree from Eastern Illinois in limnology, which mm. is the study of freshwater ecosystems. Mm. So he's a biology type of a guy. So he's the pond professor yeah. on YouTube. And this is one of the things too about um, you surround yourself with people who are smarter than you, right? So mm -hmm. I could... I, I know basically the concepts that Ed's talking about, but like he lives and breathes it. I call him the Jacques Cousteau. I don't know if you remember that. You're a little young. The Jacques yeah, yeah, Cousteau yeah. of the water gardening industry. People will listen to Ed for hours on end, you know, talk about pond ecology. Mm -hmm. You know, I know enough of it so that I can sell ponds and I can figure out what's going on with things, but I'm not going to sit there and go into the micronutrients of how the bacteria cycle works and, and mm -hmm. everything else. But I don't have to because I have somebody that works for me that loves that stuff. And that's yeah. his, that's his strength. Yeah. Well, so Greg, you were saying that you, you would have to pick out these things called books from a, something called a library. Yeah. Uh, and they were all from, from Japan and, and Asia. I think, does that, uh, is that still reflected in your style of of ponds, or did you did you take up your own style? I always see water lilies and that's kind of associated with, with, uh, with Japanese water gardens and stuff like that. Did you, is there a Greg Whitsock style? Because I, I look online, I see your thing, and I'm like, I think that's probably his. Sure. Uh, if I'm looking through Instagram. But but what do you make of like the the art of do you have your own style? Most certainly we do. Um the Japanese style, which is more of the, the you know the gardens. And actually, when I would think of water lilies, I would think more of the English water garden. Interesting. So so it was in, all the books were in Europe or in Japan that I that I read about, and that's why I made a lot of the mistakes with concrete and whatnot. Hmm. And Japan is very about feng shui with a garden, you know, and how the whole element works with stone and water and, and, and plants. And uh, we're very, uh, and then Europe is really just a place to grow water lilies. I mean, they're not super, especially back then, big into the koi fish like Japan was. Yeah. Um, well, we wanted to work with mother nature, not against her. That was our byline. 
and we we figured out a, a philosophy of working with mother nature by actually using the pond itself as part of the filter just like it does in nature where everybody else was trying to pull water out of the pond and filter it externally that is certainly part of a, a, um, our filtration system is what you know when i patented but it's putting all of the elements rock and gravel plants and fish the mechanical and biological, the pump and the plumbing, and putting them in combination in the aquascape ecosystem, mm -hmm. which the basic philosophy is to let the pond itself become the filter with supplemental filtration with skimmers and biological filters, but not trying to put in pulling all the waste out and trying to use external uh, removal, but you actually use the plants and the fish and everything else to work as an ecosystem inside. Yeah. And that, it makes so much sense now. Like once you've done that, you look at that and go, oh yeah, that makes sense. That's exactly what happens in the swamp or in the fan or whatever. Yes. Uh, you guys have these like aqua blocks, maybe they're called the big old black ones. And you, you make a little wetland. Do you do that with all the ponds? Is that part of your, your system or is that just a specialty for some ponds? Correct. So the, the larger the water features, we tend to do wetland filtration because is you really can't beat it in terms of the surface area for bacteria colonization, colonization and growth. Uh, but our standard backyard pond is just a skimmer on one side, a bio falls on the other, the pump and plumbing in between, and then the rocks and gravel, the plants and the fish. So mm -hmm. um, uh, that's so basically the wetland filtration is for bigger bodies of water, like the lake that's a 600,000 gallon pond that I'm looking at right now. But an 8 by 11, 11 by 16, you know, pond in someone's backyard, just skimmer on one side, bio falls on the other. Okay. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so as I've been following uh, Aqu Aquascape and, and the stories going on in multiple YouTube channels, uh, I heard about this this roof collapse. Um, can you can you talk to us a little bit about that? Like what? How, how did you guys bounce back from that? And what what was the deal with that? Well, when you're 51 now, like I am, the longer you live, the more you realize that God has a sense of humor. That's right. And so for the first 17, for the first 16 years of Aquascape growth, 1991 through 2006, we had double digit growth every year, double digit growth. We were an Inc 500 fastest growing privately held company four years in a row. Our, we had over 2000% growth rate over a five year period and uh, 91st fastest growing privately held company back in geez, 2001, maybe anyway, 2006 was, uh, uh, great sales 2007 was flat, which was a little weird when you buy double digit growth, but we were still doing almost $60 million a year in sales. And so, uh, the 2008, I did everything the exact same way that I did in 2000, you know, for basically 17 years. And I had $12 million less to show for it because wow. of the great recession and home equity lines of credit going away and people, you know, conserving their cash and not investing in, um, you know, luxury items like necessarily water features. And what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Mm -hmm. I, I realized, you know, quickly who was on our team and not on our team. Um, we had 195 teammates at the time. The first round of layoffs, I'm in every one, and everybody was basically like flipping me the bird as they were leaving. The second round of layoffs, we had three rounds of layoffs. The second round of layoffs was about half and half, half the people shaking my hand and thanking me um other other people getting all pissed off and the third round of layoffs which was really unfortunate we had we had cut into the bone now we went you know fat first a little bit of muscle and fat the second and the bone the third because every single person gave me a hug and thank for keeping them all out raw, right. raw good so we basically got our sales cut in half we basically got our teammates cut in half and then in 2011 right when things were starting to get better we had 24 inches of snow in chicago we had a 50 degree temperature change in a, over a 10 day period that snow uh, um, melted, and on February 11th, 2011, our building collapsed under um, all the 24 inches of melting snow. And thank God it happened on a Sunday. Nobody was here. Yeah. And uh, um, we were basically out of business because we couldn't get into our building. It was condemned, you know, which is a crazy thing to think about. Um, we couldn't get to our servers for like three days while they were shoring things up. And uh, thank God for friends because we moved three to Flavors of North America, who's a, a buddy of ours. And we spent the next six weeks in his location, huh. well, cool than everything else. And then the next year, 2012, rebuilding uh, Aqualand, which uh, it cost $18 million to build it, dollars to rebuild it. Wow, man. Is it the same location that, as, uh, as the collapsed one? Oh, yeah. Yeah, okay. we 
just we just had the there was five sections of the building and two of them had to be completely rebuilt. Okay. Wow, man, that's that's wild. It's uh that is like the cherry on top of just a really hard season and then your roof collapse. Yeah, thank God that, that no one was there. That is crazy. Um yeah. but this is what happens when you're in business for 30 years. If it's not a roof collapse or an economic collapse or people stealing from you, it's it's something. All business is is fixing problems. So right now we're having record sales and we can't get product because of you know all the supply chain disruptions. Right. So it's just pick your poison. Yeah. And the challenge is not letting it get you down. The challenge yeah. is keeping a positive spirit and will because uh, your attitude determines your altitude. And mm -hmm. these are things that I learned on a football field, yeah. not, on, not in a classroom. Right. And, uh, you know, so if you try to avoid problems, you can't. And also you don't know what you're made of and not only what you're made of, but what your team and is made of and the people that work with you are made of. So for mm -hmm. me, um, um, even though I would not want to go through any of those experiences again, I look at every single one of them as, as coming out the other side better. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's huge. Uh, I think another, another interesting thing about you is you cooperate with a lot of other pond builders and you have them, they even come out. I'm sure they probably pay you a fee or something, but th you come, they come and they learn from you how to build these ponds. Some people might think, dude, you're kind of you're giving away your secrets. Like, what what's the deal here? Why why are you so cooperative with other with other pond builders? Well, when you help other people get what they want, you get what you want, mm -hmm. and uh, it's not quite as you're looking at it because, of course, I make money when they succeed because they're buying my products. Hopefully, they don't have to. I could teach them technically, and they could go somewhere else. Yeah. Um, but. Uh, my philosophy of this business is to help my customers succeed. And so what I've also learned, and this is really cool, and it's totally happening, and it's, this has taken a long time to create, but we have a culture. Like I said before, winning culture is the key to success. We have a culture where competitors will actually work together in their marketplaces, yeah. and it's more co-opetition. What's worse for business in, it's counterintuitive to many industries and the way people think is having a competitor that comes into your marketplace that's undercutting everybody. It has a competitor that comes into your marketplace that is um, uh, doing poor work and reflecting poorly on you know water features in general. You know, yeah. oh, I don't want a water feature. There are a lot of work. Yeah, because the guy built it not like an ecosystem pond. So the tribe, which is what we call Aquascape, you know, customers. The tribe mm -hmm. is a very valuable part of the value add of aquascape because it's a bunch of like-minded passionate you know people who want to help each other grow their businesses mm -hmm. and the best way to learn something do you know what the best way to learn something is since you're a a, a podcaster and a, what is the best way to learn something do you think to uh go out and do it that's uh, what most people say but there's actually okay. even a better way Men mentorship is it is it learning from someone um the best way to learn pretty much anything is to teach it. Ah, okay. Okay. Because when you teach someone, you have to really learn the material yourself. Yeah. So when the student was ready, you know, the teacher arrived is what they like to say. But what's happening is a lot of the experienced certified aquascape contractors are taking, you know, the new guys under their wings yeah. and uh, they're teaching them the profession and teaching them how to do ponds done right, customer serve right, which is the mantra of the certified octopus contractor. And then um, they have a strong competitor, but it's more of a co-opetition because these guys help each other a lot. You mm -hmm. know, when it's, it's really tough to get a labor force out there and when I need extra work, I can call, you know, my friend over or vice versa and uh, get someone to come out and do some physical labor and work with on a project. And then of course, you know, estimating projects and bidding projects. And so there's all sorts of ways that, you know, what we call it is collaboration nation where we can yeah. each other, help each other, help each other with their businesses, but learn in the process because the best way to learn something is to teach it. Yeah, man. And all these, all these lessons that you've learned by, by doing business, yeah. uh, that's what people write in books. You know, they talk about uh, creating, creating a, a, a culture, right. And, and you got this living, living the aquascape, aquascape lifestyle. And it's like all these things that you've just picked up over the years that's what people are, are trying to put into a book, but you've learned it by going out and doing it and, and making money while you're doing it. I think that's, that's awesome. I wanted to, um, 
just a, a couple more questions here. You, you got a favorite pond? Was it like maybe that first one you built or you, you built one for Shaquille O'Neal? That's kind of a big deal too. Do you have a favorite pond, favorite build? Uh, well, the Shaquille O'Neal build was pretty cool because the collaboration, once again, like we just talked about with um, Certified Aquacy of Country Artists of the Year. So it was an invite only. It was in the middle of COVID. Plus, you know, it would have been crazy if he would have done it as a build a pond day. So we had about uh, eight companies nine companies that came together and uh, we worked over uh, a week, four or five days in, in May of last year to build that. And it was just a spectacular project. That was a lot of fun. My favorite build besides Aqualand, which is my, my recreation pond at uh, Aqualand um, is a project that we did in um, Columbia, South America. Hmm. So uh, we had our own TV show. We had a reality television show called Pond Stars on that deal wild. Nice. And it's, reasons that I'm a YouTuber today because of the challenges of working with a network and getting a script every day. Even reality TV is scripted. Right. Um, and a, a fan from, uh, from Columbia, South America, that was a, a big developer, fell in love with the show. He's a big nature guy. Uh, Ed flew down to Columbia. I thought Ed was crazy. I'm like, what are you doing? Why do we want to build a project in Columbia? I'll tell you why we want to build a project in Columbia. $2.3 million. <laughs> That's a good reason. Couple he good reasons. Designed a shopping mall around his water feature. Uh, he thought he got a lot of flack from his board and from you know his uh, family and stuff. But when we were all said and done with the project that we did in Villa Vicencio, Colombia, for La Primavera, which is the only major shopping mall in that area, um, it was the signature thing of his entire project, and everyone mm -hmm. loves it. They take all their pictures, their wedding pictures, and. The whole shopping mall is designed around a waterfall and pond that comes out of the jungle that literally has a hundred thousand fish and hundreds of turtles living in it, crystal clear water. So swimming in that pond was like, you know, a dream, you know, for me. And I've only been there one time. My crew built it without me. You know, this is a, I'm not in the field. I'm working on my business, not in my business as much. Right. Uh, but I can't wait to get back. I was supposed to get back and then COVID hit. So I can't wait to get back, but it's a, uh, it's an absolutely spectacular project. And it's nice when you have the vision and the budget that combine. And that's how we, you know, that, that would probably be my most favorite water feature in 30 years that our team has created. That's awesome. Yeah. I've, I've seen, I've seen that maybe on Ed's channel or something. I'll have to look at that again. Yeah. Um, all right. So as we close out, so we usually talk philosophy, theology, yeah. um, but we're talking nature and life. I want to ask you more of a philosophical question about, about beauty. Um, your, your ponds are beautiful. You're obviously looking to make a beautiful pond and you guys do it really well. Do you think, uh, is, is beauty in the eye of the beholder or is it something objective that's out there? You're trying to match the beauty in nature. Like where, what's, uh, what are your thoughts on, on beauty and, and, uh, making ponds? Good question. Um, the ponds that any contractor built in the beginning that they were proud of, they thought, thought were so beautiful and everything else. A few years later, they would look back at them, me, hmm. myself included, and go, oh, my God, I can't believe I built that. Yeah. Um, so, like, yesterday, I went to my friend's house, and they're, they've got a 20-year-old 20 20 year and a 17-year-old, and they built a pond with their mom and dad, and mm -hmm. they were super excited to show, me, show it to me, our pondless waterfall. And I looked at it, and I'm like, okay, well, you know, the first time that I built my water feature, I did it seven times over. <laughs> uh, you know to learn it so uh you know what why don't i just come over here and we can redo this together and it was really funny because the 17 year old his face just dropped he's like we spent 25 or 30 hours you know working on this i'm like well you learned what maybe you know we, we can make it a little different right. and so we went out there yesterday and ripped it out completely and mm -hmm. rebuilt it in two and a half hours which they were just blown away by because yeah. this is our profession this right. is what we do and uh the the mom is just you know she's just it, besides herself with and they and they they love it too they so it looks like a bunch of four year olds built ours but before <laughs> I rebuilt it they kind of like liked it a little bit I guess mm -hmm. but um and then I look at it and I go I, I know that you know Brian my my second longest teammate at twenty six years he would even done it nicer than I would and that's the whole thing that the students have surpassed the teacher both Ed and Brian can build a nicer water feature than I could. Mm -hmm. um, because that's what they do every day. They're in the field, you know, this yeah. is, you know, uh, and I'm working on the business and not in the business. So right. yes, uh, beauty is in the eye of the beholder and ponds that any contractor builds in the beginning 
will look completely di- they'll be happy with them but they'll look completely different after they got a little bit more experience under their belts yeah well so greg are you are you matching are you matching the beauty in nature or are you saying we're taking nature and we're making a, a cultivated uh, uh what, what's the what's the the philosophy there well remember the guy that the ups guy when he delivered the pa- package to the backyard yeah um he thought it was natural he thought it was mm. natural spring that came up which is an ultimate compliment to a a guy yes we are studying nature like i just said i got off the trail the appalachian trail with my son that was his graduation (laughs) gift and he's a cross country and wrestler like you know so he picked my butt out there i'm like i'm too old and fat for this stuff but (laughs) it was fun um uh i i i pretty much stopped well at least the first two two days at every waterfall that i saw just to look at it and get a video of it and a picture of it just because it's still exciting for me to see all of us to see how mother nature does it and i would say that we are uh we are there in terms of it looks it looks natural right when we're done you know the way we way the water falls off the stones and the settings and not making a waterfall too tall and all of the things and tips and tricks that you pick up in nature and then you master you know, as uh, you know, this is our, our profession. Okay. Well, that's awesome, dude. This has been, it's been great to just kind of pick your mind on, on uh, business and ponds and beauty. It's, it's been super fun. Uh, I'm looking forward to, to coming and filming uh, at, at the Aqualand with, uh, yeah. with you yeah. guys. I want to see Woody. Cause I'm a, I love alligator snapping turtles since I was five years old, been obsessed with them. So I love seeing big ones. I had um, yeah. So, so I'll, I'll link that uh, when, when we do that, but you have- I think, how would you as a kid get an alligator snapping turtle? Well, I didn't. So I got a common snapping turtle. My dad found in the, the prairie path. We grew up in Lombard. And, yeah. um, you know, and so then you kind of get obsessed with them then. And then you go to uh, all the different uh, swap meets and stuff like that. And I finally got one from Loggerhead Acres uh, when I was an adult. Yeah. I've, I, I've, I've been, I, that's where Woody came from, Loggerhead. That's right. Yeah. So, yeah. So how long did you have that turtle? Oh, uh, I still got them. Yeah. I got, I got four of them now. Oh, cool. How big? Well, uh, one of mine's only two years old and he's like the size of like a 15 pound tur- uh, 15 year turtle i i talked to john i talked to uh greg from greg's turtle haven they're all oh. like he's just a freak he's just a, a freak uh, i don't know why he's so big so yeah um well how, how old is the longest one that you have oh he's only he's only like four years old okay yeah. okay yeah. well we just we, yesterday's vlog was about greg's turtle haven yeah yeah i watched that one too i mean i watch all of them i'm, I'm a i'm a huge fan of, of what yeah. you guys do and and all, all those guys, uh, they're, they're awesome. And I love what you do when you, um, like garden state tortoise, you guys, you know, yeah. donate a, uh, a, a pond to these people who are doing conservation work and, and that's really cool. It's really nice, but actually the ripple effect from that is huge. Cause now some kid's going to watch that. He's going to go up, grow up to be a herpetologist and work with them back terrapins and keep them off the road. Amen. It's uh, that's, this is what I, uh, this is why I love to say, what do I say? You love your job. I love my job. <laughs> I can make an impact, right? And that's that's the thing that really brings me fulfillment is is seeing how phenomenal of pond builders Ed and Brian have become. Mm-hmm. And, and of course, Ed is just such an impressive man with his knowledge. But you look at a guy like Brian, and I'm just so proud of him because he's now a leader. You know, he leads an industry with how he runs the local market that we like to say is our R&D department. And... um the greatest satisfaction in life, I'll give you another quote. Yeah. Greatest satisfaction in life is helping someone else reach their fullest potential. Yeah. It's not about you. It's like, come on, I get to spend, you know, you know, multiple days hiking with my my, you know, 18 year old son in the Appalachian Trail. I mean, I would do anything for that kid. And I wanted to have a bonding experience with him because, you know, I sure hope he surpasses whatever success I've been able to achieve in my life by a factor of a hundred. And that would just be that would just make me the proudest dad in the world. But it also makes me as a, as an owner of a company to see guys like Ed and Brian and just blossoming and, 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 and they're completely different people, all three of us. Yeah. Right. Different people, but you got to find your strength, you know, and our strengths are different. And you know, the, um, you get way further in life by developing your strengths and fixing your weakness. Yeah. Most people don't know that, you know, I grew up in a, in an educational system, which is why I'm not a firm believer in the edu- traditional education system um and that was you know i was never good at math because i had a i was born with a right brain you know you know which is creative versus a left brain which is you know mathematical yeah but i got accountants that work for me <laughs> and, they, and they and they 
yeah, they were born with, you know, left brains because they're way better at the numbers, you know, than I am. But you got to find your strengths and then you got to develop your strengths. So I, I play in the little areas that I'm good at and I try to avoid the rest of them. And then I have 130, 140 teammates that are around me that are that I make sure that they're on the right seat of the bus and uh, stay out of their way as much as, as, as much as I can. And that's how you build a culture. That's how you build a team. Um, that's how you build an industry. And, um, and those are the philosophies that I've used to build Aquascape. Yeah. Yeah. That's just, it brings up one last thing is you, you, sometimes you hear, you know, pick a job that you love and you never work a day in your life. Um, it seems like you're actually doing that is, yep. do you have to, do you have to have a good personality to, to succeed as well? That's kind of something that I've, I've thought if somebody really loves something, but they kind of suck, uh, or they're just weird, like people won't flock to them. But if you love something like ponds or turtles or whatever, and you're really excited about it. people are like drawn to that. So what's like the, what's the special sauce to actually follow your dreams, I guess. So listen, man, um, Ed is a scientist and he sells scientifically. Brian is kind of an aw shucks, you know, even though, you know, he's, he started here when he was 18 and now he's whatever, 44, you know, all three of us sell completely different, you yeah. know, based off of our personalities and how we do it. And there's no, no, there's no one that's better than the other. It's yeah. you got to sell, you got to design, you got to live and in, in, in whatever your style is. So, so some of the funniest people I know are like the most laid back and they have dry senses of humor, right? That's yeah, right. wired with a dry sense of humor, but they're hilarious. Um, and you got to just find your strengths. So the, the, the bottom line here is they might not be a vlogger, right? They might not have the personality to be a vlogger, or maybe they are, and maybe they have a, you know, they just have that kind of style that, that for whatever it is they're vlogging about that, that works. Yeah. So the, whole, the whole point of it is, is you got to be comfortable in your own skin, whatever that is. And don't try to be somebody different because different is different. It's not better or yeah. worse. Okay, man, this has been huge. This has been really helpful. Uh, even thinking through my own stuff and podcasts and all that stuff. Uh, Greg, thanks so much for all your time and thanks for what you do uh, with conservation and helping out YouTubers and all that good stuff, man. I, I really appreciate your work and I, I love watching all the content you guys put out. Hey, fantastic. Am I going to see you in a couple of weeks at Aquashella? Uh, I don't even know about that, but maybe, yeah. Yeah, Alp in Schaumburg, Aquashella, Coral 12G. He puts that on in Chicago every year and uh, we have a booth and, and put some demo ponds in. So that's not, Schaum Schaumburg's pretty close to you, actually. Yeah, it's super. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll be there, man. That'll be awesome. And then uh, I'll, I'll try and set up something with... Uh, with Ed to come out and, and give a, a video of, of uh, Aqualand, my, my first time finally getting there. I will I will make sure that, that you get to visit Aqualand and Ed the Pond Professor, the longest That's minute Aquascape gets to show you around. That's awesome. Awesome, dude. Well, thanks again. Um, folks, that's going to have to do it for now, uh, but maybe we'll continue this conversation later. Uh, this has been Parker's Pensies, and as always, all glory to God. Amen.